But I don't know about you, but I love these baptism mornings. Love these baptism mornings. I love seeing people getting baptized. And I love hearing stories like the ones we've just heard. But I also know that if church isn't your usual place to be on a Sunday morning, then all of this can feel a little bit out of context. It can feel a bit like, actually, if you've walked in on the middle of a film and you kind of see a few of the characters involved and you perhaps get a bit of a flavor of the story, but you perhaps don't see the full narrative and you perhaps don't kind of get who the real hero of the story is. Well, if that's you this morning... I'm just going to spend just a few minutes just talking about how this morning fits into a much bigger story. And if that's not you, if you've been here for years or you've been a Christian for years, it's just a chance to reflect again on why the Christian story is such good news. So we are going to look at the Bible, we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 15, as Richard said, so from verse 19 onwards, um, and hopefully it'll come from the screen, there it is. So it says this. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who've fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive, but each in turn. Christ, the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. And then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he's put all his enemies under his feet, and the last enemy to be destroyed is death. So if I were to ask you, what are the greatest victories in your life? What are the greatest victories in your life? I wonder what you'd say. Maybe there are people here who have um, kind of amazing sporting achievements. Maybe there's an amazing sporting achievement that you look back on. Or maybe there's a defining moment of success in maybe in school or in university or in your career. Or maybe for some of you, you'd say that actually your, your, your best victories are your more personal victories. Maybe in kind of your marriages or how you've brought up your children. Well, knowing that I was going to ask this question to you this morning, I texted my mum last night. And I said, Mum, can you remind me of some of the great, glorious victories of my youth? And here's what my mum said to me. She said, well, there was that that time you went to that Cub Scout camp and you brought home that trophy because you didn't cry even though you were really homesick. (laughs) So that... That is apparently the defining moment of glory in my youth. Well, what are your greatest victories? In the passage that I just read, Paul is writing to the church in Corinth, and he's writing about victory. It's a huge passage, and what Paul is doing is this. He's setting the resurrection of Jesus within the whole context of the story of humanity. And he takes us right back to creation and to Adam, the first man, and he takes us right forward to Christ coming again, and to the end of the world. And what he's saying is that ultimately, the story of the world is a story about victory, and that Jesus is the hero. So what I want to look at this morning is just three things. What is Jesus' victory? What does it mean for my future? And what does it mean for me now? So let's look back at the passage. What is Jesus' victory? Paul writes this right at the start of that verse. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But Christ has been raised from the dead. See, the context of this is that many people in Corinth at the time were asking the question, what happens when we die? It's a great question, and it's a question that all of us will face. And if you asked that question today, perhaps went out into the streets in Wickham, and you asked that question, you would get a whole variety of different answers. Well, Paul is really clear. And what Paul does is he starts by reminding the church what happened to Jesus when he died. He says, but Christ has been raised from the dead. And for Paul, Christianity stands or falls on the resurrection of Jesus. To be a Christian is to believe that at a point in history, a real person died and then came back to life again. And actually that this was no accident, but that this was God's victory plan all along. If you look right back at the start of the biblical narrative, you see people, Adam and Eve, 
who mess up and who disobey God, who turn away from him. And the punishment for their sin is death. But God loves his people. God loves his people and he's faithful to his people. And right from the start, he puts in this plan, worked out over generations to have ultimate victory over death and to rescue his people. And years later, Jesus comes. And in his ministry, he commands pains and sickness to go. And he tells storms to be still. And he casts out demons. And all the way, he's on his way to this this final greatest victory against death. And he goes to the cross. And on that cross, he takes the punishment for everything that any of us have ever done wrong. And he dies on the cross. And his body is placed in a tomb. And if the story ends at that point, this is no victory at all. And what Paul is saying in that passage is if it stopped here, we as followers of Jesus would be of all people most to be pitied. Because actually we'd be celebrating no victory. But we know that that's not where the story ends. On the third day, when the women go to the tomb, the stone is rolled away and the tomb is empty. And Jesus has gone through death. It's a, an emphatic victory over death. And just like in his ministry, where sicknesses and demons submit to him, now even death has no hold over him. If you're here this morning and you haven't investigated the resurrection of Jesus for yourself, I want to encourage you to do it. This is a real person. Read the evidence. Think through the possibilities. You will find, I believe, that the historical evidence for Jesus living and dying and being raised to life is utterly compelling. So that is Jesus' victory. So what does it mean for us? What does it mean for us here this morning? Well, the thing I love about the stories that we've just heard and these stories that you hear on baptism mornings are they seem to describe the point where people realize that actually their story and God's story are linked. That actually they kind of intertwine. Often you'll hear about people saying, God has been working in my life all that, all that way. He's been working to bring me back to him. And as the five people get baptized in just a moment, what is going on is they are being identified with the death and resurrection of Jesus. This is a powerful, significant morning. And I want to say to you guys getting baptized this morning, enjoy this. You'll be able to look back on this in years to come and think that was a big day. This is about identification with Jesus' death and resurrection. And it means that actually for, for those getting baptized and for us who put our trust in Jesus, that his victory over death is now the defining victory in our life. And the reason I say that is because it has massive implications, both for our future and for us now. So what does it mean for our future? Well, if you look back in that passage, Paul writes this in verse 20, but Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who've fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. So Paul describes Jesus as the first fruits. And this is kind of an agricultural term, a kind of farming term. And what it means is that actually the first fruits of a harvest, when they come through, it's a sign that the full harvest is coming. Now I'm no gardener myself or farmer myself, but even I know that when those little green bits come up through the ground, when they break through the ground... Actually, it means that something else is on its way. And what Paul is saying is that the resurrection of Jesus should show us that actually our own resurrection, if we're Jesus' followers, is coming. That we can have faith that this is going to happen. Complete faith. One guarantees the other. We're meant to look at the accounts of Jesus' resurrection in the Bible, at him walking and talking and eating with his friends and think, wow, one day that is going to happen to me too. That is what we're meant to see it as. And notice how Paul describes people who have died in that passage. He calls them those who have fallen asleep. What a wonderfully temporary picture that is of death. And Jesus talks about death in the same way. There's that moment where where Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. And people around are mourning. But Jesus says, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. But I'm going there to wake him up. And then there's that account in the Gospels of where Jairus' little daughter dies. And Jesus says to the people, stop wailing. She's not dead, but asleep. And he takes her by the hand and says, my child, get up. So how should we view death as as Christians? Is it just a natural part of life? I believe the Bible says no. That actually death is the enemy. But it's a defeating enemy. Jesus has beaten death through his resurrection. So as much as it pains us and shocks us and hurts us, 
that actually ultimately it's temporary. So for those guys getting baptized this morning and for all of us who put our trust and faith in Jesus, we can have confidence that one day we will inherit that new life where there's no more death and no more suffering and no more pain. And Jesus says, and Paul says, sorry, the reason that we, we get to do that is because we are in Christ. So what does it mean to be in Christ? Well, a few weeks ago, we went on a family holiday to Australia and we chose to go by aeroplane because we thought that actually if we tried to go to Australia in our own strength, we would probably fail. Okay, simple. We booked our tickets, we got on the aeroplane, we strapped ourselves in and we put on the movies for 22 hours. That's what we did. And when the aeroplane went up into the air, we went up into the air. And when the aeroplane came down on the runway in Sydney, we went down into Sydney. And the reason that we did that was because we were in the aeroplane. And we got to enjoy the full blessings of Australia and our family holiday away because we have been in that aeroplane. And Paul says it's like this, that you get to enjoy the full blessings of Jesus' victory because you are in Christ. Because you are in him. It's not because of anything you've done in your own strength. It's because of what he's done. We get to live off the glory of his victory. And of course, there's a challenge in that as well, because Paul writes, for as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But those two alls aren't the same. Paul is saying that all of us are in Adam. All of us, because we're human beings through our humanity, we're all in Adam. We all sin. We all turn away from God. But he's saying that not everyone will be raised to that new life. It's only those who are in Christ which begs the question this morning, where are you? Where are you, where are you this morning? If, you're, if you would say that today that you are in Christ, then you can have full confidence that you get to see the things that Jesus got to see through death. If you're not in Christ, I want to encourage you, there's an invitation here this morning that God stands and says and invites you to be part of this amazing story. Just by putting your trust in him, just by admitting that you can't save yourself and that you're completely reliant on him to save you. But what does it mean for us now? That's the future. What does it mean for us now? I don't know about you, but I don't think the world always looks like we're living in a victory. I don't think it always looks as though that great enemy, death, has been defeated. There's still death in our world. There's still sickness. There's still cancer and pain and depression and unemployment and rejection. And even as I say those things this morning, they might be very, very real for people in this room. You might be going through some of those things right now. Or actually for you, it might just be that you don't feel like your life is much of a victory. I just want to read to you this. This is um, Andrew Wilson's book, God's Stories. And he writes about a true story. And he says this, You may have heard about Lieutenant Hiru Anoda, who refused to believe that World War II was over and remained in hiding from 1945 until 1974, when he was finally reached by college dropout Norio Suzuki. He'd lived under a false view of the world, pledging allegiance to a long-defeated power for 29 years. Suzuki proclaimed to him the good news that the war was over, and Anoda finally brought his life and his, be- and his behavior in line with the truth. So to be a Christian is to line up our thinking and our lives with the truth that Jesus has won. And that doesn't mean detaching ourselves from reality. It doesn't mean kind of living in this Christian bubble while the world around us is hurting. But it does mean knowing what kind of story we're in. And it does mean knowing whereabouts in the narrative we are. Paul writes in that passage, Jesus must reign until he's put all enemies under his feet. And the last enemy to be destroyed is death. See, one day, one day, all enemies will be put under the feet of Jesus. But right now, we're living in this time between the first fruits and the full harvest. That's where we are in the narrative. And to line up our lives with the truth, means I, th- I think it means a few things. One, I think it means that we can love our world. We can get stuck into loving the people around us. Knowing that actually in Jesus, we have the answer to all of the world's problems. The second thing I believe it means is this, that we can actually have a deep peace and a deep joy. Whatever we're going through being confident that ultimately Jesus has won, that he has had the victory. And finally, I think it means that we can pray. It means that we can pray huge prayers for ourselves, for the people around us, for situations, actually knowing that if there's hope even in death, then there are no hopeless situations in life. The first fruits have come, 
And the full harvest is coming. And the world is moving towards the end of that story when everyone will see that Jesus has had victory. So for you guys getting baptized this morning, I want to encourage you, enjoy this. Enjoy this. This is a moment of identification with Jesus. For us as a church, let's see this again as a chance to celebrate his victory. And for you this morning, if you don't know Jesus, I would encourage you, just ask God to reveal to you the truth this morning about this Son of God who has had complete victory over death once for all. Amen? Amen.